On March 26, 1884, the city of Cincinnati, Ohio, was waiting for a jury to convict a defendant who had been accused of murdering a man the previous December. The jury came back with a verdict of guilty, but not of murder. Instead, they convicted him of manslaughter, and that just wasn't good enough for the people of Cincinnati. Over the next several days, some of the most destructive riots in the nation's history illustrated the many tensions that the nation was facing during the turbulent times of the Gilded Age. It is history that deserves to be remembered. On Christmas Eve, 1883, 55-year-old William Kirk told his wife that he had a feeling he shouldn't go to work that day. I do hate to leave you, but business compels me, he said, and he left her with his six-week-old child. According to his friends, Kirk liked to show off his wealth, though he wasn't actually all that wealthy. Mr. Kirk was in the habit of carrying large sums of money on his person, and I warned him time and again to be more careful of it. He was very fond of displaying it. His habit had attracted the attention of two of his employees, 18-year-old German William Berner and 19-year-old mixed-race Joel Palmer. For weeks, they'd been planning to attack their employer and steal the money they knew he carried, which they thought was at least $600. They had agreed that the one who struck first should receive $50 more than the other. Shortly after 5 p.m., the pair saw their chance. According to their confessions, it was Berner who struck first with a hammer and Palmer followed with a club. To make sure he was dead, the pair then strangled him with a rope. He actually carried only $283, but they hid the body and distributed the money. Later the same day, they rented a wagon and hauled Kirk's body to a creek where they dumped him. Kirk's body was discovered two days later. The Cincinnati Inquirer reported on December 28th, under the headline, A Christmas Horror, that Kirk had been discovered the day before, disfigured, with his skull crushed. Though several others were held on suspicion, Joe Palmer was arrested by the 28th, while Berner had gone to Indiana to see relatives. He returned on the 29th and was arrested, according to the Dayton Herald, on his way to give himself up at the police station. The evidence seemed clear. The owner of the rented wagon remembered running it to the two men, and the police found blood there and in the stable. Before long, Palmer and Berner were pointing fingers, and they confessed to the crime in writing. On January 3rd, the pair was brought before the court and were already attracting a large gathering of spectators. Palmer was said to twitch relentlessly while Berner's eyes were fixed upon the floor. They are charged with murder in the first degree to be indicted the following week. They were expected to go to court in February, a date that was likely postponed by terrible flooding that month in Cincinnati, as the Ohio River rose to record 71.9 feet. They didn't actually go to trial until March, and in between an embezzlement scheme was uncovered in which local politicians were stealing money that was intended for flood victims. The public's interest in the case had much to do with a perceived failure of the court system in Cincinnati. There were 23 murders awaiting trial in Cincinnati in January of 1884, and there had been at least 93 murders in the city in 1883. Of 50 arrested for murder the past year, only four of them had been hanged. The Cincinnati Inquirer summarized the issue. Laxity of laws gives the Queen City of the West its crimson record. Preeminence in art, science, and industry avail nothing where murder is rampant and the lives of citizens are unsafe, even in broad daylight. But the Inquirer itself was not innocent in the city's problems. The Inquirer was owned by John McLean, a high-ranking member of the local Democratic Party. With Republican lawyer Thomas Campbell, the pair controlled much of the backroom dealing, bribes, and corruption which defined Cincinnati's politics in the late 1800s. Campbell was suspected of repeatedly bribing jurors or getting his friends on juries when he was in court. The city was also the site of two other major Gilded Age issues, labor and nativism. The city had seen a serious riot break out when anti-nativists of the Know Nothing Party attacked German immigrants in 1855. A major manufacturing center, Cincinnati was facing labor unrest over the city's poor working conditions. Tensions were high and the city was nearing its boiling point when the verdict came back on March 26th. Thomas Campbell had been hired by Berner's reasonably well-off family to defend him, and the jury selection had dragged on, with more than 200 people brought forward before 12 unbiased jurors could be found. The Hamilton County prosecutor succeeded in getting the jury sequestered immediately after their selection. The courtroom was already full of onlookers. Importantly, Campbell had gotten the indictments separated, allowing him to defend Berner alone. Palmer, without family and of mixed race, was left to the wolves. It seemed like an open and shut case. Witnesses had seen Kirk show off his money that day in front of Palmer and Berner. The stableman testified he had rented the pair of the wagon. Berner took the stand in his defense and told a new and dramatic story. He said he turned to find Palmer ambushing Kirk. I wanted to run away, Berner testified, but Palmer stopped me with the hammer and said that he would kill me if I did. 
He had been forced to help hide the body. I did not kill or assist in the killing of William H. Kirk, he finished. His confession, he alleged, had been written after a night of questioning which he hadn't been allowed to eat or sleep, and he hadn't meant it. Despite Berner's dramatic testimony, the jury knew full well that there were two murder weapons involved, both a hammer and a club, and the judge had ruled that the confession was perfectly legal. Meanwhile, John McLean saw an opportunity to destroy Campbell and ran a full-page article in the Inquirer on March 9th that blasted the city's corruption and accused the city of failing to keep its people safe. Crime was handled with indifference, cynicism, and neglect under the headline, College of Murderers. McLean described in detail some 15 murders and their perpetrators, writing darkly that 1883 and 84 had been an unusually successful and prosperous season. Closing arguments began on March 22nd. Campbell said he was aware the clamor for his conviction is strong, and then compared the judge to Pontius Pilate, and by association, Burner, to innocent Jesus. Then he pressed that the confession was false, and that without the confession, there is no evidence to convict Burner. Four days later, the courtroom was full to bustling. The jury came back with its verdict. Guilty, after a pause, of manslaughter, not of first-degree murder. The courtroom immediately erupted into a fury. Burner couldn't be hanged for manslaughter. The greatest punishment was 20 years imprisonment. Members of the crowd shouted, hang him, over and over. The jurors were immediately in danger. The foreman went into hiding. One juror was beaten by a crowd. Another found that he had been fired. A crowd descended on the house of one L. Phillips, broke windows, and filled the place with eggs and dead cats. Turned out to be the house not of the jury member named Phillips, but of a completely unrelated person of that name. Burner was sentenced to the maximum 20 years, and still the judge declared the verdict a damn outrage. The sheriff, Civil War veteran Morton Hawkins, hastily arranged for Burner to be spirited from the city. With a single deputy and not in handcuffs, he was taken by train to Loveland, Ohio. But their news had already spread that it was on the way, and waiting for the next train, Burner was recognized, and a lynch mob quickly formed. The mob attacked, but focused on the deputy instead of Burner, and the convicted killer escaped. By March 28th, crowds were gathering in Cincinnati. One paper wrote that even the most conservative people could not look upon the efforts at lynch law with the abhorrence that they would have under ordinary circumstances. A meeting was called at Music Hall. Well-to-do elites hoped to turn the event to their advantage, to reform or perhaps simply seize power in the local government. But the crowd that filled the Music Hall wasn't in the mood for talk. The speeches against corruption were fiery and demanded the juries flee the county. If Tom Campbell is the dishonest man you believe he is, let him go too, someone in the crowd shouted. Speakers didn't seem to realize that the crowd was losing control. They went on to pass resolutions as the crowd, fueled by alcohol and unaware that Burner was already gone, was moving across town to where 13 deputies were guarding the jail. It's unclear how many joined the mob as it charged across town, but the number was certainly in the thousands. Alarm bells went off all over the city. Weapons were found. A gun shop was emptied. And for 45 minutes, the jail was under siege as looting and violence began to spread. The rioters even acquired a cannon. Sheriff Hawkins was a veteran of the Civil War, and he hung on. Police managed to reach the courthouse next door, which had a passage that led to the jail. Rioters began entering the building through second-floor windows, the chapel, and finally by beating down the heavy iron front door. Burning barrels were flung into the building as the crowd stormed through every hallway, destroying everything they found. Cincinnati had the nation's first professional fire department, which arrived to battle the blazes, but the rioters wouldn't let them near the fires in the jailhouse. The second defendant, Palmer, was one of the first people the crowd stumbled on. Someone shouted, you're Palmer, but he responded, no, Palmer's black. Can't you see that I'm white? And thus the mixed race Palmer escaped with his life. The sheriff and his deputies were able to clear the cell block and Hawkins called in the nearby militia, which had already been on alert. The militia arrived and immediately opened fire. A policeman was killed, though by whose bullet no one could tell. The militia entered the courthouse and opened fire again, hitting both rioters and policemen, though one of the officers was sure that he had been shot by one of the rioters. By early morning, the militia and police had finally cleared the streets. For a moment, things seemed calm. The inquirer crowed, At last, the people are aroused and take the law into their hands. Saturday brought word that Burner had escaped in Loveland. Campbell, who tried to return to his job as usual, was advised he should leave. Sheriff Hawkins left to recover his prisoner and assured all that if the mob returned, the jail would be safe. We are thoroughly prepared for them and will hold the mob back at all hazards, he declared. Ohio Governor George Hoadley had ordered in the 14th Ohio Militia to assist, along with other companies. Meanwhile, handbills were being distributed which announced that public safety demands action. Heal sores by purifying the body, 
Serve notice to criminals, criminal lawyers, gamblers, and prostitutes to leave Hamilton County within three days. At least Burner was recovered, announcing to deputies that found him, Take me in, for God's sake! He reached the Ohio Penitentiary safely. But violence was still in the air. Dynamite had been reported stolen from a quarry. Rumors swirled. The saloons and bars remained open. Remarkably, the Cincinnati police had three Gatling guns on hand, and they were rolled out in defense of the jail. As evening fell, young, mostly working-class men prowled the streets. Crowds attacked the militia's barricades, throwing rocks and firing guns. The mob approached another gun shop, but this time the shop was defended and a gunfight erupted. It was during this night that some young men were able to break into the courthouse. From there, the building was set aflame, and soon black smoke poured from the building. Theories have abounded that the fire may have been set deliberately to destroy records of the dirty dealings of the city's elite, though there's no evidence to support that claim. But the fire did destroy nearly all of the courthouse's records, including just about every historical record relating to the town, dating back to its founding in 1788, as well as a 20,000 volume law library. The fire burned unchecked. The fire department refused to endanger themselves without police protection, which couldn't be provided. As smoke poured from the courthouse, Captain John J. Desmond of the Ohio Militia led a group of men through the courthouse onto the street. In the fighting, a rioter steadied a shot and hit Captain Desmond in the head. He was killed instantly. Hawkins called in a fourth regiment of militia from elsewhere in town, but as they approached the rioters, they inexplicably turned around and left. Some of the militia might have chosen the side of the rioters, but primarily confusion and fear seems to have led to the regiment's retreat. Seeing the fleeing men, Hawkins ordered the Gatling gun brought forward and was fired at the crowd along with volleys from the militia, and finally a charge by the militia, including the African-American Duffy's guard, cleared the streets. The morning brought uncertainty as churchgoers and children explored the wreckage. Militia still guarded barricades and occasionally shots ran out. The very courtroom burner was tried in days before was destroyed, looking like an ancient amphitheater open to the heavens. On the floor were the rubs of the floors above and the beams of the sheeting of the roof. The riot was in the news all over the world. The Chicago Times hoped that when Cincinnati has recovered its reason, it would reform its courts, while Cleveland's plain dealer wondered if the jury were knaves or idiots. The New York Times opined that the riot had been inflamed and worsened by the militia. French author Victor Hugo declared the Paris of the New World destroyed the courthouse, just like the Bastille had been stormed in 1789. The rioters of Cincinnati inaugurated the era of glorious revolution. They were champions of justice. They were more than champions. They were heroes. They were more than heroes. They were men. Some newspapers echoed that sentiment, with the London Spectator writing that for once we find ourselves sympathizing with rioters, while another editor wrote that the riot tortures the conscience and the self-respect of honest men. Harper's Weekly called for intelligent citizens to reclaim their government from special interests. Campbell faced disbarment proceedings, prosecuted by, among others, future president and Cincinnati native William Howard Taft, though the effort to have him disbarred ultimately failed. Campbell left Ohio. After numerous delays, Palmer was hanged on July 15, 1885. He was the last man hanged in Hamilton County as future executions were moved to the penitentiary. The courthouse was rebuilt, and a statue of the slain John Desmond erected, now stands in the lobby of the courthouse. Burner, for all the trouble he caused, served 11 years in prison, and then quietly moved out of the state. Ultimately, the riots resulted in 56 deaths, including one police officer and at least two members of the militia. The riots had also attracted several men from Kentucky who apparently were spoiling for a fight, but most of those were successfully stopped at the border. Riots continued into Sunday, but on a much smaller scale, and the last brawl occurred sometime around midnight, only included some 40 or 50 rioters. The riots did bring an end to John McClain and Thomas Campbell's control of city politics, but that only inaugurated the rise of Republican Party boss George B. Cox, whose machine would control city politics for decades to come. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.